Good evening, good evening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a slushy SVA evening. Not slushy in here, slushy outside. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Tom Hoon. I chair the, what is it that I chair? Oh, the BFA program in visual and critical studies. And this evening, we're really, really happy to sponsor someone really special to have here to talk with us about her work, Liz Magic Laser. Liz, I'll tell you just a little bit about her background. Liz graduated from Wesleyan University in 2003. In 2008, she completed the MFA program at Columbia. And then the following year, she did the Whitney Independent Study Program. And since then, she's just been really busy with um, residencies and fellowships and performances. And I looked at her her CV and started counting things up and realized over the last four or five years, each year she's done between three and five solo performances or solo installations. And in each of those years, another dozen or so group shows. And um, so very busy, very active, very wonderful. And I'm really happy that SVA features I think uh, at a key moment in Liz's career because back in 2011 when Performa was going on, we had a wonderful um, piece that Liz did at the big theater on 23rd Street and it was an incredible success, um, a really one of the key events in the art world that year. Um, so welcome, come on in. Um, so Liz is going to talk with us tonight about her work and show us a lot of um, snippets from different performances. And um, please join me in giving Liz a very warm welcome. Thank you for having me, and thank you, Tom, for the beautiful introduction. Um, it would. Um, what Tom failed to mention was he was my teacher, and he was really mentored me at age you know, 19 and 20, and so it was in his class that I was first introduced to Freudian theory and Greenberg, so it's um, a pleasure to be here in, the, in this lecture series. Um, so I'm gonna just jump right into it, and this is from my very first scripted video piece, my background's actually in still photography. And so this first um, scripted video was um, a one-sided conversation with an ATM machine where um, it was sort of a fraught relationship where it wouldn't give me what I wanted and I sort of broke up with it. Um, but it also made me uh, quickly realize, because it was maybe five minutes long, that I am not a performer. I have not trained as a performer until quite recently. I've started to dabble in a few acting uh, exercises. Um, but so luckily, I had, um, this is actually the first um, performance that I was in at a few weeks old. My mother is a choreographer, so I grew up in her rehearsal studio. And so where I was going with that is that luckily I had been um, in a community where I knew quite a few performers for most of my life. And um, as a photographer from a teenage years to present day, I, I was doing the um, production photographs for my mother's company. So this postcard or posters, press images, and then some of her dancers um, started to do their own work as choreographers. Uh, so this is Azure Barton, and my mother's name is Wendy Alserman. Um, and so this Azure was in my mother's company and I would do her press photographs and the dancers, we would sort of trade and help each other out. They would be in my sort of directorial photographs tableaus. And so the, around the time um, I tried that first uh, um, scripted piece and realized I was a terrible actor, I um, was lucky, I think a week later, uh, I was in grad school at the time at Columbia, 
And a week later, a uh, theater directing student named James Dacre asked me to collaborate on a, on a production of his where I did photographs and video for the set um, of a play called The Error of Their Ways uh, at Here Art Center. And so anyhow, I was not so familiar with working um, with the theater or working with actors, and I ended up in the tech booth operating dowsers um, for three different projectors and was a little overwhelmed with it, but really loved working with the actors and continued to work with them uh, afterwards. So um, after that first intervention in, uh, in the ATM vestibule space, I kind of kept thinking about wanting to do something else there. Um, I had this basic kind of recognition of it as uh, sort of every, as sort of the equivalent of going to the bathroom for money and for our finances and this, that it was almost like this daily bodily function where you don't, you know, just the way you probably don't remember the last time you were in a, use, you know, use the gang bathroom stall yesterday. You don't really remember the last time you took money out in most cases. And I started to think about, you know, how there's elevator music playing there and the, that you don't um, really, you're not usually inspired to engage with anyone else there. It's a very individuating kind of space. So I went back there and just had this very simple idea. It wasn't even an artwork exactly. I deposited um, a slice of prosciutto into my ATM. Uh, machine into my account and it disabled the machine and it really felt like more like a stunt but I, I kept the photo up on my studio wall I think for a year and kept thinking about wanting to um, go back into that space as well I um, every time I thought you know because I disabled the machine and a few people had gotten a few other bank clients had you know gotten huffy and walked out um, that there might be some kind of repercussion for it because certainly it must have been caught on the um, surveillance system and and so and I had also you know entered my pin number and whatnot so basically I every time I got a chase envelope in the mail I kept thinking oh is this gonna be some kind of notice or fine and it never was it was always just my statement and so after a, a, some it was just kind of vague in the back of my head and so after maybe six months, it was clear there, were n there was never going to be a fine. And I started to think about um, basically the kind of strange interaction of cameras that had happened during these first two little ventures into the ATM space that, um, uh, that for me, the surveillance camera represented a threat of repercussions and also that my subjective you know, snapshot camera or small, uh, I guess it wasn't, I did bring an HD larger camera, probably an EX1 in there, that bringing cam a camera in there of my own was perceived as a threat um, by the other bank clients and as well potentially to uh, the bank itself. And so I wanted to do um, a, a um, full on play in that space. And um, at first I thought, okay, I'm gonna cast it and I'm going to work with, I'm, it's going to happen on Sundays, and there's a bank on every corner in this city. So, um, so if we get kicked out of one, we can just move to the next and the crowd can follow. And at a certain point I realized, you know, I, don't, I had very little experience working with actors, and um, this was going to be very difficult to pull off on my own, and I started to think, how can I do this? Uh, carry this off and it suddenly hit me that I could ex execute it exactly the same way I did the first video with each person individually. So I basically cast nine actors and it was an early, um, an early Brecht play called Man Equals Man. Um, and I would meet with each one individually and we would, we would work through the script so that they could deliver all of their lines from the play. Um, and use the other bank clients and inanimate objects like the ATM machine as their um, supporting cast. So we would find, be sort of looking for all the double meanings um, in, 
um, in the script so that um, the lines could make sense in the context of the full play when once they were, would be stitched back together, but also they would make some kind of immediate sense and resonate. You know, there were lines, and so this, without getting too heavy into the plot line, um, Man Equals Man was, I think, um, Brecht's second play, and he, it was heavily based on Kipling, you know, the Jungle Book style thing, and um, it's a kind of allegory of brainwashing, where these, this machine gun section of four British soldiers are sort of uh, wreaking havoc along the uh, countryside in colonial India. And um, they break into a temple and are totally trashed. And um, one soldier gets injured, they steal gold, and they end up ditching the, inj the injured soldier, their comrade. Um, because they're like, you're going to be a walking wanted notice. You're going to give us away and we'll um, all get in trouble, maybe even executed for this. And so um, anyway, they need to have a temporary replacement for their soldier and they um, uh, coerce this guy into pretending to be their soldier, this um, sort of local simpleton on the side of the road. Um, so I'll just play you a little clip from that, and it's the full-length video. When, once it was um, montaged back together, the proper dialogue as it was supposed to unfold, um, with a lot of diver uh, diversions um, from you know conversations that we had with people in the bank vestibules and such. Um, so this is even more disjunctive than the real thing because it's about two and a half hours and this is just a few excerpts. Air Virgil Brecht hopes you feel the ground on which you stand sliver beneath your toes like the shifting sand. So that the case of Gaily Gay the Porter makes you aware that life on this earth is a hazardous affair. Get an applause for that. <laughs> what are you doing? You're called. Wait, have, have a moment. Yeah, Gally Gay. Perfectly true, that is my name. Catch anything? Oh boy, I am catching things. This is a shocking establishment. This temple doesn't fight fair. Be careful. This poster has been up around the town saying that a military crime has been perpetrated in our town. And none of the parties have yet been identified. I had just put the water on around this time yesterday. But you never brought the fish. What's this about a fish? You're talking as if you lost your wits in the head of all these gentlemen, too. Before the sun has set seven times, this man must become another man. Can it really be done? You're acting in one man into another. <laughs> yes, one man is like the other man. Equals man. So yeah, you caught that scene where he's, his wife comes looking for him and he pretends he doesn't know her, even though he never came home to make the fish. Um, so as I was editing it, I was able to go to the Brecht Archive in Berlin and um, do some research on early productions of the play. And, was, and it was the only place you could see this um, 1933 production, of a video of it, a film of it. Um, and I was totally shocked to sit down and watch it, and it was still images. It was one frame per second. It wasn't a film, exactly. It was a film, but it was a film, a stop motion film. And so it took, actually, even the director of the archive 
didn't know why. And it, uh, it wasn't until um, an art historian friend of mine, Tom Williams, um, sent me this essay that explained um, how both um, Bertolt Brecht, the, uh, I should have explained as a German avant-garde playwright and theorist and director, um, working in the 1920s and onward. Um, so he and Benjamin and a lot of um, that kind of uh, Frankfurt School and avant-garde theater practitioners of their day became very preoccupied with scientific management and these kind of films, um, a la Moybridge, you know, the horse galloping, um, that were used to, uh, to innovate the assembly line. And that's why this play had been documented that way. Anyway, it's something that really stuck with me and I ended up using it. You'll see um, that method um, a little bit later in a subsequent project. So this was um, the artificial elephant prop that uh, was a key uh, plot device uh, in the play. And then this was my artificial elephant, which became uh, this elephant costume for a kind of play within the play that was performed at the exhibition opening. Um, moving on to the um, uh, commission I did for Performa here at the SVA Theater in 2011. It was called I Feel Your Pain. And um, the theme of that year's Performa, which is a biennial for performance art that happens um, in no early November every other year, uh, was Russian Constructivist Theater, which was quite lucky. And I, in terms of my interests, and um, I became really interested in this moment where the Soviet and German avant-garde uh, reacted against the traditional theater's use of emotion and illusion. Um, and especially because I was noticing, as were many you know, editorial journalists at that time in 2010 and 2011, noticing um, the emotionality of American politicians. It was this era of John Boehner crying frequently, that kind of rise of the Tea Party movement which and especially um, male politicians were often you know, crying or displaying their emotionality. And um, seemingly it was, a, very, it was um, a highly cultivated performance of emotion or a cultivated um, rupture. And so I became interested in how um, these uh, techniques of method acting that, you know, the uh, performing art and art world had forsaken long ago were, you know, in full swing on the political stage um, and wielding quite a bit of power and uh, that they were becoming ever more efficient in their innovation of how to use um, these techniques. So um, also around the same time, I saw an interview where Glenn Beck was interviewing Sarah Palin and it was supposedly their first meeting ever. And he starts the interview by you know, opening up his diary and saying to her, Sarah, I want to read to you what I wrote about you in, in my journal last night. And it's, that struck me even more so as, um, a, as um, him sort of taking a line out of a Hollywood movie, something like a you know, 80s romance. So um, I ended up scouring many different interviews with politicians, um, with American politicians, looking for these, um, these moments where the dialogue took on the character of romantic banter or a marital spat. And it ended up, um, and so I, I wrote a script that was entirely adapted from these snippets although I replaced a lot of pronouns and often would take um, uh, sentence fragments and splice different interviews together. However, my rule was I wouldn't make anyone sound more ridiculous than they already did. Um, and so it was a live, done as a live film in, a, in the movie theater on 23rd Street. Um, and it, there were three uh, um, videographers and it was a live feed and everyone who showed up and the audience was also in the film. I'll play you a moment from that.
Hey, can I read you what I wrote in my journal last night? It's about you. Tomorrow, I meet her for the first time. I'm actually a little nervous, as she is one of the only people I can see that can lead us out of where we are. I don't know yet if she's strong enough, if she's well enough advised, or if she knows she can no longer trust anyone. I don't know if she can lead us and not lose her soul. Remember when Ed Muskie cried? <laughs> Yeah, in 72. Yeah, that journalist slandered his wife and he jumped on the soapbox to defend her honor. By attacking me, by attacking my wife, he's proved himself to be a gutless coward. And maybe I said all I should on it. It's fortunate for him he's not up on this platform beside me. A good woman. <laughs> Do you get the anger? I have the anger inside me. <laughs> a guy that's been in the gutter and spent a good deal of his life in the gutter should think twice about accusing me. Okay, fingers don't come any closer. Fuck him. Oh, that's it. Oh, Fuck him. him. Come on, guys. Hey, come on. Hey, hey, hey. Will you resign? Do you, Do you expect, expect to stay? I came, came here, here to, to accept, accept the full responsibility for what I've done. done. The question that people, your constituents, and a lot of us have is, what, what were, were you, you thinking? thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. I don't think I was thinking. It, it wasn't, wasn't part, part of, of a plan. plan. Have you really apologized to the people? To all of you who were misled, to everyone, to, to all, all Americans, Americans, I am sorry. sorry. I apologize, I apologize to, to you. And so the, um, all of the source material was cited both in intertitles on screen and as well as in a um, playbill program. So that's also something I should mention that I'm usually, um, you know, tend towards the TMI in terms of making sure it's clear uh, what material is being um, adapted and precisely where it's being sourced from. So um, also something that some research material that came into the writing of the script was um, looking into uh, this form called the living newspaper that's um, manifested as a number of different incarnations over the years. but. First and foremost, as a form of Soviet street theater and a, quite a massive um, uh, collaboration uh, between journalists and, uh, and theater practitioners, actors, theater schools involving thousands of people um, in the um, early 1920s. Um, so this is an image from, from one of the street performances, although there were also stage performances, and uh, an American uh, theater director, producer, um, came there on a Fulbright and saw some of this work and basically imported that idea of a living newspaper 10 years later um, for a, a Depression era WPA theater program that was also called the living newspaper. And um, that was a stage form and it was more of a performed essay. Uh, this was one by Joseph uh, Lucy who um, and in this case, injunction granted was um, about the history of labor rights in this country. And it, there were a few um, fixtures to that form, like having um, a clown. In this case, it was more of a, a tramp clown. And um, I had a more you know, present day quintessential red nosed clown. And there was also a voice of the living newspaper, a live voiceover. So I um, pulled some of those elements into um, the writing of my script, that, something, that was something that really made it congeal. Um, so after doing this first um, fairly large scale endeavor, or two, I, um, the ne in the months afterwards, I needed to find a way to uh, work in a more gradual, small scale pace, and I was also in retrospect, have often realized that I'll um, sort of bounce to what I left out 
or excluded from the last project. So in this case, I'd been so focused on rhetoric and um, I then kind of bounced to body language afterwards. And it was something that um, was, uh, came up because of uh, Obama's 2012 State of the Union address in, um, um, in, I suppose, February of that year, I believe. And, or maybe it was January, right? Um, so he was so virtuosic in his gestures and it already felt like this mashup of many different references. Um, and I started to look back at previous president, American presidents and look at their um, use of gesture. And I was quite surprised to find, th uh, I thought I was gonna, I wanted to look at this um, streamlining again of the perf techniques from the performing arts um, that were being used in, um, by politicians and business leaders. Um, and so I thought naturally it would be Reagan who I could compare him, Obama to and show this arc of the development and the maximizing the efficiency of the um, um, politician's empathic display. Um, but Reagan didn't move his hands at all during either his inaugural address or any of his State of the Union speeches. And it was actually um, Bush, H.W. Bush, Bush Sr., who in 1990 um, first started bringing uh, uh, gesticulating back into play for these more official speeches, at least. Debates are a little bit of a different story that has some gesturing, but the more official speeches, it was like hands on the script, you could take a sip of water, and as time has gone on, um, those kind of uh, uh, little you know, human things are vanquished from the politician's display. So anyway, I worked with two um, Cunningham dancers and Alan Good on the left was um, doing a selection of gestures I called from, um, from, from Bush's 1990 State of the Union and then Corey Kresge, um, also a brilliant dancer, uh, was doing a selection of, of gestures from the Obama's 2012 one. Um, this is some other research material that has been quite important to my work. Um, the French theorist named Francois Delsart, who was an acting uh, teacher and um, um, theorist of the uh, mid 19th century. And he um, codified quite explicit meanings for various um, hand and arm gestures as well as facial expressions. So that was something I looked at a lot. And I also thought back to this um, stop motion film as a language that um, is used to, uh, to um, uh, maximize the efficiency of every gesture. You know, that you don't take the, if you don't recoil the hammer quite as far, you can get, you know, 20 more hammers done per minute, uh, right? So, I was looking at um, that use of the stop motion film um, for um, streamlining gesture. And in the end, that became a way to, um, to actually uh, rearrange the tools necessary for a political speech. And um, there was a camera going at a frame per second that then I put, the, instead of having the dancer speak, the mic was put up to the camera and it became actually an amplified metronome that um, gave that sort of a um, mechanical efficiency air to the piece. So you'll hear that. So initially they were on pedestals in a gallery setting um, and, then, and then I also did it in the geodesic dome. We staged it um, at PS1 in their geodesic dome which was a great um, setting for it as well because it felt more like a political rally scenario. Then the following year I did a sort of international edition of it that was called Stand Behind Me. 
um, where I used a selection of, of nine different politicians in the, in the lead up to the performance. This and the performance happened in three places, first at Listen Gallery in London, and then at Wheels in Belgium, and then at the, in Bulgaria, Sofia, um, in Sofia, Bulgaria, at the National Palace of Culture. So I had this kind of lineup to take it on tour, and um, I wanted to engage with each place we were rehearsing and performing in, and so I, I, it became a way also to um, have, have a conversation, have an engagement with the curators or organizers in each place, and I would tell them to let me know every time an interesting um, speech had happened or incident had happened, and um, actually, there was, I think the week after I made that request, there was an assassination attempt during um, a minority leader's speech in, in um, Bulgaria, in Sofia, and so we ended up staging the performance where, in the same place where that had taken place. Um, anyway, in this case, I knew that I needed to communicate who was speaking, when, what they were saying, and so I used a teleprompter to let the audience know, and it also became a device for making people look into the camera, and it um, ended up, it w um, I also, the reason I um, came to desire that um, scenario for it um, is, is I simply noticed that in, during the, the um, election cycle leading up to it, this seemed to be um, a more and more common uh, media strategy to you know, have people behind a speaker, which is kind of ridiculous because you would never, you want to look at someone's back while they're speaking, but it's clearly um, staging this liberty leading the people type of image, and I, I was interested in arranging that for this. And it was great, right after, this is the, um, became known shortly after as the Chancellor Rhombus. It was uh, designed for Angela Merkel Chancellor Rhombus, and this was in the um, uh, Palace of Culture in Sofia. Um, so next I may kind of breeze through this one a bit. Um, I also became interested in the setting and scenario of the television news and wanted to work with um, the way the news basically stages reality and what, the, and the started to look at um, how that's staged by the performers of the news or the deliverers of it, and that you have this anchor man in the studio, and then um, or anchor woman in the studio, and they cut to a reporter on the scene who's closer to the event, and then you get um, a clip of a real person who is experiencing the event, and apparently that I, I came to find out that. Um, in Newspeak, they call that the actuality, and it's supposed to be 12 and a half seconds of a real person giving testimony. And so I wanted to work with those three roles, and, and I started to think, okay, what script can I um, put into this context to um, unearth these strange dynamics and also the dynamics with the public, with the audience watching it, um, and when it, it dawned on me um, that it had to be, of course, um, Sartre's No Exit or We Clo, um, which I have had come to feel was almost every play I saw. Certainly most Beckett plays are some kind of version of No Exit. And this, um, um, his, uh, this uh, allegory of a three-way relationship that's uh, unhealthy and a vision of hell seemed like the proper thing to put in this scenario. So I, this happened in Sweden, in Malmö, and I'll just play you a, a short clip from that. So it was rehearsed with the actors in the same space, and then they, were, they had to deal with being in separate spaces and with communication breakdowns, and a three second delay for the satellite system. A bit like extreme sports for actors. Hmm, so here we are. Yes. And this is what it looks like.
Yes, this is what it looks like. And we're rolling. We'll be going live in five. Is there any information you require? Okay. That's the way it works here. Okay, I see. Thank you. Torture by separation. Must you be in there all the time, or can you take a stroll outside now and then? We're stuck here. Oh, that's too bad. Please, Garzang. What do you want of me? You can help me. If you want help, apply to her. That's right. That's right. Trust away. She wants a man. That's far you can trust her. This camera. Yes, now's the moment. I look at this thing and I understand that I'm in hell. You remember all we're told about the torture chambers, the fire and brimstone. Old wives' tales. There's no need for red-hot pokers. Hell is other people. So also another channel in the video became myself and um, the whole tech crew who were as well stuck in this situation um, until the actors were able to finish performing the play. And it was then presented at the Kunsthall in, in Malmö in Sweden as a, as a five-channel video. Um, so it was the three characters, the control room, and the um, teleprompter. Um, I also then uh, came back to New York after doing that and um, had some ideas about uh, doing more process-oriented performances and videos that would more immediately respond um, to the news of that day or that week. And so um, I had been invited to um, do a residency on the street, um, in a storefront um, uh, on the street in Chinatown um, at a place called Forever and Today. And I sort of set up my news bureau of reception was how I was thinking of it. And the day I moved in, I um, got an email from CNN asking me to do uh, a video for, um, for their online gallery in the lead up to the election that year. Um, so, I think, in the interest of time, you can find it online quite easily. Um, but it was called Push Poll, and it was basically looking at the, manipula the manipulative nature of, of um, so-called man-on-the-street interviews and on poll, on um, the influence that polls have um, in determining uh, public opinion in elections. Um, uh, then following up on that, um, I, the following year, in 2013, I did um, a project in Münster, Germany, at a Kunstverein there, and I enlisted a local journalist there um, who was um, doing a few box pop, man on the street interviews a week for the local news, um, as well as an actor, and um, the thinking for this piece was um, to create what I to elaborate further on this newsroom of reception set I had been working on in my studio and to make a full-on uh, theater set of it. And so I worked with a, um, a stage set designer and we built this model, which then uh, was built in full scale at the Kunstverein and used both for the filming and the viewing of, uh, of the video, which was basically a conversation between uh, these American and European archetypes of democratic discourse, so the American one being the reporter and the European one being this um, uh, little man or Kleine man who um, hangs out in the cafe and spouts off. And I was looking into um, these ideas of the public sphere in, in um, Europe and um, uh, coming from um, Habermas, the, the German uh, sociologist, and this idea of cafe culture, but it's also really one that's proliferated in film and television, this idea of uh, uh, the cafe being the place where um, 
where public discourse really happens, where people form their opinions and can speak about the daily news. And so we set it up as a functional cafe as well, where people could come and have coffee and, and read the newspaper. Um, and so it was a hybrid cafe meets news bureau set, in this case, um, with a uh, 3D, lo the 3D news logo uh, behind the scenes that then was filmed and became the uh, backsplash for the second set. So I used a disco ball and made it into a, a globe to become the kind of screensaver for then the TV uh, television news studio meets uh, nightclub bar which uh, was not used in the film, but used as the, as the setting for viewing the film. So you could sit to watch the, the two-channel video and be kind of caught between the two characters. Um, you would sit in the swivel chairs at the anchor desk and you know, spin back and forth. Maybe I'll just do the very start of it. First, Zuerst, fast, genau. accurate. Ich glaube, der will ins Fernsehen. Ja, okay. Entschuldigung, eine kurze Frage. Ja. Sagen Sie, kennen wir uns nicht? Ja, irgendwoher. Ich weiß nicht, wo. Ja. Hold on a second. I think I know that guy. I don't think we can continue. Kommen Sie aus Münster? Manchmal. Really? Ich bin mir ziemlich sicher, Have dass wir uns met? schon mal irgendwo gesehen haben. Not that I know of. So it's um, the guy in the cafe is both uh, speaking to the other people in the cafe and speaking to the TV um, as if it's addressing him. Um, shortly after that, I did this project at um, a, a sort of project space that Paula Cooper Gallery, Paula Cooper Gallery set up nearby here, um, and in this case. I worked with um, this, I wanted to work with the scenario of a political strategist basically marionetting, puppeteering a um, would-be candidate. And um, also at this point I'd started to work with journalists and uh, as well as political strategists in, in some um, projects and had this kind of excess material from interviewing people and workshopping material. Um, and and basically um, uh, got back in touch with a political strategist in Texas I had worked with um, to talk about um, uh, the script for this project, which became a cross between um, all, all this material I had collected um, from my own workshops and um, the play, the French play um, by Edmond Rostin called Cyrano de Bergerac. You probably know the Steve Martin version called Roxanne with it's the guy with the big big nose and he has a way with words and he helps this you know young uh, good-looking brute uh, seduce the woman he's in love with by feeding her lines so in this case it was um, the would-be candidate feeding um, was fed lines by the political strategist in the back room I also used this um, audience response system keypad device, um, which then um, produced, let's see, um, if you'll see, it, it produced graphs uh, that, that um, the candidate and the test case audience were then green screened onto. So, they, so t about 12 uh, audience participants entered in uh, their data, gender, income, and so on, um, marital status, and then the graphs. They had to um, enter constantly their approval rating or disapproval rating for, um, for my candidate. Um, moving on to a more recent uh, piece that I finished a year ago, um, I started to sort of branch off from you can see from what I've shown you that I was very focused on um, the on politics and news production for a good four years there, and um, strangely, uh, TED became my sort of branching off point uh, because it's 
that its immense popularity seemed to be emblematic of um, how important public speaking is across every field these days, that it's no longer just the politician or business leader that um, needs to be uh, charismatic and persuasive in order to um, uh, wield power, but um, a scientist who needs to fundraise. Um, you know, if they, I had been hearing stories about people being, you know, an MIT scientist being asked to do a TED talk and spending um, a good bit of chunk of time for a year to prepare for it because it's that important for determining whether you get to move on in your career or not. Um, so it seemed to me, you know, emblematic of, of um, both a kind of techno idealism of, you know, if you are the best you can be and if you are, um, then you will benefit the greater good, you will benefit all of society. If you are you know, the best entrepreneur you can be, and the most charismatic you can be, um, and the best performer you can be. So um, again, I, I'll usually either have a, a scenario that I want to work with or a script, and I'm kind of looking for um, the right uh, context or script to pair with it. Um, and it's usually a kind of generative friction that, I'm, that is somewhat elusive at times that I'm looking for. And in this case, um, there were a number of, of scripts that, there were a few scripts that I scrapped before arriving at um, the idea of, of working with an adaptation of Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground, um, which then was a perfect fit because it's really an attack on the socialist ideal of enlightened self-interest. Um, again, that idea that if you're the best in individual you can be, you will um, uh, benefit the greater good. And um, so it was the perfect um, attack to insert into a, a TED scenario. So we'll play you a minute from that. People everywhere and at all times have preferred to act as they chose, even when it was contrary to their own interests. And sometimes they absolutely should. And that is my idea. One's own independent choice, however wild it may be, is that most advantageous advantage which we have overlooked. While I'm alive and have desires, I would rather my hand shrivel and fall off than overlook my independent choice. You believe in building a perfect world, a crystal palace that can never be destroyed. But I'm afraid of your ideal system because I'm not allowed to criticize it. I can't even stick my tongue out at it. And I don't say this because I love sticking my tongue out at things, but I resent systems that stop me from doing so. Head, stick your tongue out at me. Come on, I'll do it back. So it was an audience of actor of um, extras of actors. So I ended up really using. You know, they had to watch this. They had to watch lis slash listen to the speech a few dozen times. So I ended up using their kind of malaise to be this um, uh, image of apathy, as well as. Um, uh, so I worked with a ten-year-old actor named Alex Ammerman, and I ended up really as well using. Uh, his uh, moments of feeling overwhelmed by the uh, uh, $40 words and intensity of the material um, in the kind of upset and frustration um, in, the in the final video. Um, oh, and so the big 
coup of it was that uh, Ted asked to put it on their blog and wrote a review of it, um, which I got quite excited about um, because I'm, I'm quite a, a game for these moments when, um, when the work can reach a wider audience and to be put out there through the same platform that it's um, critiquing and engaging with was exciting. So um, this is from the installation of it at a gallery called Various Small Fires in Los Angeles. Um, and there was also a companion piece um, that I made with um, a vocal coach and her 10-year-old daughter named Ella. And I had um, the vocal coach, um, Kate Wilson, teach her daughter how to be the coach. And we, um, um, as I was working on rehearsing the, the TED piece with Alex, we were um, looking at the techniques for preparing that are used to train and prepare someone for, um, for public speaking and trying to find um, workshopping ways to find um, like-minded um, uh, analogies for these, um, for these training exercises that would be in line with um, the uh, Dostoevsky text. Um, I was also just thinking about how public speaking is all about affirmation and to um, kind of invert that and make these exercises about negation. So I'll also play you a minute from that. Imagine your worst enemy is right here in front of you, and since you have a bow and arrow, you decided to shoot them. As you pull back your arrow, do a mmm sound, and as you release your arrow and it goes onward, do a ah. So pull back your arrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah. people you most hate in the room. There's one standing here, one standing there, and one standing there. And you just made this amazing new language where the three worst things you can say are the bee, the bay, and the ba. So let's try that. The bee, the bay, the ba. The bee, the bay, the ba. The pee, the pay, the pa. The pee, the pay, the pa. To tee, to tay, to ta. To tee, to tay, to ta. To dee, to day, to da. To dee, to day, to da. Kaki, kake, kaka. Kaki, kake, kaka. Gagi, gage, gaga. Gagi, gage, gaga. Um, these are also some uh, sculptural works that were in the show um, that were meant to be uh, devices for training in this new method of uh, public speaking and learning. Uh, this was um, also based on uh, the work of Francois, of Francois Del Sartre. So he had this uh, diagram to illustrate the meaning of arm gestures. And again, the, um, the, codif the code is all about um, affirmative gestures. And I replaced them with, you know, instead of glorification, it was self-promotion. And um, terms that were like uh, acute consciousness that were coming from the Dostoevsky text, as well as um, ideas that were coming from the TED. Um, scenario. And I'll just um, finish with the most recent uh, video I made uh, that was working off of, off of um, this last exer training exercise video as a departure point. I wanted to continue working with this performance training and coaching, and I wasn't sure how. And I had an invitation to do a commission um, in Toronto at a great nonprofit called Mercer Union and um, started visiting there last uh, maybe a year ago in the dead of winter and thinking about ice hockey and ice skating being a, a natural uh, thing to work with uh, in Toronto and and so it I ended up um, writing a number of different scripts I think at first it was a sci-fi child custody dispute on ice and um, that was mixing figure skating and, and ice hockey. Yeah, I, w I went through a lot of, cycled through a lot of different um, failed scripts for this. 
And in the end, um, I and I went and actually cast for one of these earlier scripts, and I was looking for a mother, father, and child. Um, and I, so I got a nice sort of tour of all the different ice skating rinks on the outskirts of Toronto um, early in the morning. And I went in to meet with this, um, with this seven-year-old girl to have her audition for the part, and she uh, fell and cried within five minutes, and her mother was her coach, and was like, she's fine, she's just being dramatic, It'll be, and she's like, just do it again, and she was totally fine, and she did it again, and the brother, her older brother, who's 11, um, named Axel, so it's Anna and Axel, and the mother's named Marie, um, he was also doing his axles and tricks around on the rink, and I was, and I was, became quite enamored with this family and left thinking, I have to, you know, forget it. I don't need to cast a family. I'm going to work with this real one. And I had been, um, in this case, um, collecting material for some kind of large essay. I was extensive essay. I was never going to write about uh, the status of the child. Um, and anyway, I'll just play you a minute from it, and you'll you'll get the gist. I think I will permit you to forget your dreams for a little while. In reality, you place too much importance on them. You look at these little people around you and think you know what we are. But what we are is actually what you have come to think about us. Let's move on. Double right away. Line your arms up, please. Okay. Come on. Down in your knee. And up. Backhand, Anna. Stretch, please. Do you even remember being a child? You might just as well have never been a child for all you can remember about it. You think of it as a gentle time when actually childhood can be violent, chorus, and cruel. Children did not always exist. They were invented. Before the 16th century, there was no concept of childhood. There wasn't even a word for child in most languages. It was only later that we began to see children as innocent and in need of protection. This world is not a good place for children. Everyone discriminates against us. We're invisible, ignored, impotent. Wow, this is getting better too, Axel. I'm happy. Are you? So, yeah, I think that's all for tonight. But if you have any questions, let me know.
This is them at the, at the exhibition opening, dancing around in front of themselves. How did you approach the family? Well, um, so I, so basically the mother, Marie, is the resident coach at this rink, and I had written a, up a, um, a casting call that I asked this nonprofit um, to send out to skating schools and skating clubs. And since she's this woman, Marie's the coach, and I was looking for um, a child figure skater, she's, she con got in touch and said that um, they wanted to do an audition for it. And um, I wasn't sure how she would react uh, a month later to me saying, OK, I, wa I want to work not only with Anna, your seven-year-old, but with all three of you, and I want to make it about you and really observe what you do. And, um, and I'm going to find a way to weave this script I've been writing into what you do. So it was um, some new territory for me, or maybe more reminiscent of my days as a photographer, where sometimes I would venture into more documentary work. And you know, there were, up until the last moment, I was nervous how they would feel about the film, um, but they were all they, they were quite open and interested in talking about the ideas. I think that specifically with with figure skating, um, there is a lot of awareness about um, the child both being sort of delicate and innocent, but also capable of rigorous hard work and capable of understanding larger ideas. So um, I think I was also quite lucky. With, with how open they were to the idea. But it was even the night before the opening, I was calling her at 10 o'clock saying, did you see the, the edit? Are you OK with it? And, and she was. And we all went to um, Sleeping Beauty on Ice to celebrate the night after. Did that hark back to you to the first, your first image of your performing with Wendy Osterman? Yes. Oh, yeah. Ah. I did not think of that till now, but it's, yeah, I have noticed, um, I'm aware of the child, mother-child motif, um, but in terms of this slideshow, I hadn't um, purposely made it so cyclical. But. And um, one other question, did you think that maybe the reason that Reagan didn't act as much as the others is because he's a film actor and not a stage actor? Well, it wasn't only him, it was everyone, every American president before him as well. So it was really not um, part of the lexicon. I, my um, sort of educated judgment of this without foundation, <laughs> exactly, is um, that I imagine there was a media strategist or multiple media strategists early on when um, political speeches first started being filmed and televised. And someone must have decided it didn't look good on film, that it was distracting to have hands waving around. Um, and, and so we were, we were still used to seeing preachers like Martin Luther King um, gesticulate gracefully on camera, but it wasn't part of um, the uh, politician's performance until or it wasn't brought back into the fold. In my mind, at least, I imagine you know these stump speeches in the 18th and 19th centuries that people probably did hold forth, and the oratorical tradition was likely in full swing um, until until these things started being televised. However, I haven't. I still I have yet to find the PhD student who's you know poli sci PhD student who's working on this, and I've asked a few of the. Um, I've asked at least the political strategists I've worked with, and um, they also have speculations like I do, but, but no one seems to have the full backstory. Yeah. Well, I have a question, which is uh, trying to, unfortunately, put all of your work in a single category mm -hmm. to understand it better. And it seems to me one of the things I want to say about it is that your work has to do in part with the way the public doesn't know itself, or when the public doesn't even know the formats by means of which it's presenting itself, and by means of which we're interacting with one another. And so sort of by distilling out the gestures or the 
um, recasting the interviews, you're providing this really wonderful reflection back to the public, which is already presenting itself. And in effect, the implication is we are opaque to ourselves in some really important way, and that you so often choose or have in the past chosen the realm of the political in which to show this opacity seems like that's part of the power of what you're up to here is, boy, we don't know what we're doing here. I'm just curious well, yeah, how you think about it. Yeah, I think of it as a, as, um, a, a very odd mutation of, you know, and of both performing arts practice and aesthetics. You know, for instance, I'll look at, especially with um, the, uh, that first newsroom piece in Sweden, I thought, ended up thinking a lot about um, the costuming and the set for the television news, and how did it get to be so cheesy? You know, it's really this sort of mutation, mu mutant cycle of the last, of each thing imitating the thing before, and um, market researchers determining that um, we have to appeal to the lowest common denominator to the most amount of people. And so then that's um, how taste gets made now. But I mean, I think about, um, I think about it more as, I, I'm more, I guess, focused on how these artistic practices are um, you know, being taken up by, um, by the kind of bureaucratic entities that hold sway and how it, n no one's exactly the puppeteer. It's this kind of bureau bureaucratic structure where you have the equivalent of, dramaturg of dramaturges advising uh, and theater practitioners advising um, uh, again, world leaders on um, both their policy making and their behavior and how they should um, answer questions and in the end, at the end of the day, also make, make policy. So it's a, it's a, I see it as a very strange apparatus where nobody totally knows what they're doing, but they have learned to behave like they do and to specialize on their one task that, you know, I'm the person who comes in and, and tells, um, tells uh, Obama what to say about um, health care. And I'm the person who comes in and, and um, teaches um, Hillary how to, how to perform her gestures. And all of these things add up to, um, to massive decisions getting made at the end of the day. But um, artists are um, probably more savvy in terms of their um, ability to um, dissect and design um, that kind of uh, behavior or costuming. And it's, I think we're just at a very strange place. That's why for they me, got the, a little the, hairy there. Yeah, but. The, the <laughs> TED piece is the most disquieting one because there it's not sort of politicians presenting that's more like this is one of the most popular formats now for showing the best and the brightest of not just individuals but of human thinking and that it's it's such and and, and other people have pointed this out too it's such a narrow format if you've watched in many or a few ted talks you see it it's a it's very in a way scripted people rehearse it in order to make it look very spontaneous and everything and that this format has emerged and is now the mark of a certain kind of excellence and intelligence is strange. I mean, I bemoan it because I always thought the college professor was the model of intelligent <laughs> performance. And now <laughs> TED Talk is like, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny moment in sort of in American intellectual life that the TED Talk has become this media phenomenon. Yeah, it's like I mean, it's lecturing. It's yeah. it is essentially some kind of uh, pedagogical presentation, seemingly, but it, it's all for the effect of inspi of inspiring, of at um, first and foremost. 
in some vague, <laughs> with some vague outlet that's uh, This is what professors are now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your talk. It was very enlightening. Um, I want to know about what inspires you most when you make your work. I don't quite understand it yet, but I feel very drawn to it. Um, and what are you looking to do next? Yeah. Um, so it's really been identifying and dissecting how the arts are, are used in these other sectors and how much power they have. That has been kind of my source of inspiration, I suppose, for the last four to five years. Um, next, I've been, I've been uh, working on uh, television show treatments, so that's sort of a side fantasy for me right now. First it was reality show treatments, and now it's um, moving towards sketch comedy, but it wouldn't really be a comedy. It would be drier than that. So, yeah. And I'd like to do something in the lead up to the election, so that's, I'm working on sort of treatments for that right now. What? What devastation do you see your shows in? Well, um, I found myself, it's a little bit offhand, but I found myself walking around saying, oh, I want to do a Netflix reality TV, sh <laughs> TV show about the news. And that was, um, I think, because I was watching things like House of Cards and thinking, you know, how, how good online TV has gotten and the production value, you know, it's um, both, but content-wise and storyline-wise, it's becoming, in a lot of cases, more interesting than, um, than uh, Hollywood film, Hollywood cinema. So um, I started to get intrigued. And then I also figured you know, they haven't had a reality show of that, um, that subverts or twists the form yet. So yeah. Do you have like, interest in cable TV? What? Cable TV? Yeah. Do you know someone? <laughs> Yeah, no, I would be interested in, in broadcast in a variety of different forms. I think it's um, clearly changing right now with online TV, but yeah, I mean, I, the, the live TV broadcasting techniques have also, I didn't show that much of that work, but I have also done a lot of a lot more of the live green screening and seven camera live editing before, so I'm in. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, you'd mentioned that you're sort of like thinking about the upcoming election. I was wondering if you'd noticed like if any of the candidates thus far have used sort of like the gesturing you'd mentioned, namely like Trump, uh, if he sort of like has any gesturing. Mm -hmm. With habits. Trump, I've been interested in how um, both it, how dismissive gestures and facial expressions um, have become, you know, he uses them quite a bit and then that kind of proliferates and these kind of like taught like throwing things out or brushing things aside and kind of scoffing facial expressions. Um, he's popularizing them. And you, and you definitely see it spreading more. Um, I, he really reminds me of this kind of trope of, of an older brother in a movie who would like, you know, stick his younger brother's head in the toilet or something. You know, he's got this real, uh, um, he's often got that kind of uh, um, retort where he shuts people down quite effectively in a, in a blunt way. So I've been, I've been looking, noticing that quite a bit. Okay, 
Can we thank Liz Laser for her talk this evening? Thanks. And giving Liz a very warm welcome. Thank you for having me, and thank you, Tom, for the beautiful introduction. Um, it would, um, what Tom failed to mention was he was my teacher, and he was really mentored me at age you know, 19 and 20, and it was in his class that I was first introduced to Freudian theory and Greenberg, so it's um, a pleasure to be here in, the, in this lecture series. Um, so I'm going to just jump right into it. And this is from my very first scripted video piece. My background's actually in still photography. And so this first um, scripted video was um, a one-sided conversation with an ATM machine, where um, it was sort of a fraught relationship where it wouldn't give me what I wanted, and I sort of broke up with it. Um, but it also made me uh, quickly realize, because it was maybe five minutes long, that I am not a performer. I have not trained as a performer until quite recently. I've started to dabble in a few acting uh, exercises. Um, but so luckily, I had, um, this is actually the first um, performance that I was in at a few weeks old. My mother is a choreographer, so I grew up in her rehearsal studio. And so where I was going with that is that luckily I had been um, in a community where I knew quite a few performers for most of my life. And um, as a photographer from a teenage years to present day, I, I was doing the um, production photographs for my mother's company. So that um, by the other bank clients and as well potentially to uh, the bank itself. And so I wanted to do um, a, a um, full on play in that space. And um, at first I thought, okay, I'm going to cast it and I'm going to work with, I'm, it's going to happen on Sundays and there's a bank on every corner in this city. So, um, so if we get kicked out of one, we can just move to the next and the crowd can follow. And at a certain point I realized, you know, I, don't, I had very little experience working with actors and um, this was going to be very difficult to pull off on my own and I started to think, how can I do this, um, carry this off? And it suddenly hit me that I could ex execute it exactly the same way I did the first video with each person individually. So I basically cast nine actors, and it was an early, um, an early Brecht play called Man Equals Man. Um, and I would meet with each one individually, and we would, we would work through the script so that they could deliver all of their lines from the play um, and use the other bank clients and inanimate objects like the ATM machine as their um, supporting cast. So we would find, be sort of looking for all the double meanings um, in, um, in the script so that um, the lines could make sense in the context of the full play when once they were, would be stitched back together, but also they would make some kind of immediate sense and resonate. You know, there were lines. And so this, without getting too heavy into the plot line, um, Man Equals Man was, I think, um, Breck's second play. And he, it was heavily based on Kipling, you know, the Jungle Book style thing. And um, it's a kind of allegory of brainwashing, where these, this machine gun section of four British souls, postcard or posters, press images, and then some of her dancers um, started to do their own work as choreographers. Uh, so this is Azure Barton, and my mother's name is Wendy Alserman. Um, and so this Azure was in my mother's company and I would do her press photographs and the dancers, we would sort of trade and help each other out. They would be in my sort of directorial photographs, tableaus. And so the, around the time um, I tried that first uh, um, scripted piece and realized I was a terrible actor, 
I um, was lucky, I think a week later, uh, I was in grad school at the time at Columbia, and a week later, a uh, theater directing student named James Dacre asked me to collaborate on a, on a production of his where I did photographs and video for the set um, of a play called The Error of Their Ways uh, at Here Art Center. And so anyhow, I was not so familiar with working um, with the theater or working with actors, and I ended up in the tech booth operating dowsers um, for three different projectors and was a little overwhelmed with it, but really loved working with the actors and continued to work with them uh, afterwards. So um, after that first intervention in, uh, in the ATM vestibule space, I kind of kept thinking about wanting to do something else there. Um, I had this basic kind of recognition of it as uh, sort of every, as sort of the equivalent of going to the bathroom for money, uh, for our finances, and this, that it was almost like this daily bodily function where you don't, you know, just the way you probably don't remember the last time you were in a, used, you know, used the gang bathroom stall yesterday, you don't really remember the last time you took money out in most cases. And I started to think about, you know, Good evening, good evening, hello everyone. Welcome to a slushy SVA evening. Not slushy in here, slushy outside. Thank you all so much for coming. My name's Tom Hoon, I chair the, what is it that I chair? Oh, the BFA program in visual and critical studies. And this evening we're really, really happy to sponsor someone really special to have here to talk with us about her work, Liz Magic Laser. Liz, I'll tell you just a little bit about her background. Liz graduated from Wesleyan University in 2003. In 2008, she completed the MFA program at Columbia. And then the following year, she did the Whitney Independent Study Program. And since then, she's just been really busy with um, residencies and fellowships and performances. And I looked at her her CV and started counting things up and realized over the last four or five years, each year she's done between three and five solo performances or solo installations. And in each of those years, another dozen or so group shows. And um, so very busy, very active, very wonderful. And I'm really happy that SVA features I think uh, at a key moment in Liz's career because back in 2011 when Performa was going on, we had a wonderful um, piece that Liz did at the big theater on 23rd Street and it was an incredible success, um, a really one of the key events in the art world that year. Um, so welcome, come on in. Um, so Liz is going to talk with us tonight about her work and show us a lot of um, snippets from different performances and um, please join me. How there's elevator music playing there and th that you don't um, really, you're not usually inspired to engage with anyone else there. It's very individuating kind of space. So I went back there and just had this very simple idea, it wasn't even an artwork exactly. I deposited um, a slice of prosciutto into my ATM uh, machine, into my account, and it disabled the machine, and it really felt like more like a stunt, but I, I kept the photo up on my studio wall, I think, for a year, and kept thinking about wanting to um, go back into that space. As well, I um, every time I thought, you know, because I had disabled the machine and a few people had gotten, a few other bank clients had, you know, gotten huffy and walked out, um, that there might be some kind of repercussion for it, because certainly it must have been caught on the um, surveillance system. And, and so, and I had also, you know, entered my PIN number and whatnot. So basically, I, every time I got a Chase envelope in the mail, I kept, thinking, oh, is this going to be some kind of notice or fine? And it never was. It was always just my statement. And so after a, a 
some, it was just kind of vague in the back of my head. And so after maybe six months, it was clear there, were n there was never going to be a fine. And I started to think about um, basically the kind of strange interaction of cameras that had happened during these first two little ventures into the ATM space that, um, uh, that for me, the surveillance camera represented a threat of repercussions. And also that my subjective you know, snapshot camera or small, uh, I guess it wasn't, I did bring an HD larger camera, probably an EX1 in there, that bringing ca a camera in there of my own was perceived as a threat.